we are glad that you are here with us this morning. I uh, do want to, to go on and say thank you uh, for just uh, continued precaution and adhering to that and uh, the physical distancing and, and wearing your masks this morning. We do appreciate that. We, we will continue for upcoming weeks uh, to be able to, to just stay in touch and, and aware of what is going on uh, here locally and nationally and, and just trying to, to care for our community as best we can. Uh, one of the things we had begun to communicate that, that we were going to unroll um, some gatherings uh, with children and families and things like that, and we're just going to put those on hold for a little bit as, as we see some spikes here in Cabell County and, and West Virginia, um, and, and just watch and, and be aware just so we can, uh, can make sure we care for everybody well. Um, here at New Baptist Church, um, we do want to know Christ. We want to grow in his word, and we want to be a blessing wherever he has placed us. And so as we do that, um, we're glad that you have joined us this morning and joined us maybe online. Um, but we, uh, we want to, to, to grow in God's word, and, and part of that is knowing it. So I want to invite you, if you would, please stand with me this morning, and uh, let's recite together our memory verse. Uh, this comes from Matthew chapter 5. Uh, verses 1 through 8. Let's say it together. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Join me as we pray this morning. Lord God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to gather here together. And God, for the opportunity to worship and proclaim your goodness. And God, for uh, your um, presence here, we, we, uh, we pray and we just ask that um, we can, uh, can be transformed by, by your word. Um, God, through the, the songs that we sing, God, through the encouragement of, of just being together in, in, in this present moment. And God, I pray um, for our, our country. I pray... Uh, for our state and our, our community, God, I, I just ask that those um, who are, are wrestling through a variety of things, that you will just be near them, and God, that you will allow us to be um, your hands and feet and light in this world around us, and God, that th through this worship this morning, uh, that you would be pleased and that you would change us and make us more like you want us to be. God, we love you, we thank you, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. If you would remain standing this morning as we begin to worship.
Okay, I'm going to read Psalm 86, 8 through 13. No pagan god is like you, O Lord. None can do what you do. All the nations you made will come and bow before you, Lord. They will praise your holy name. For you are great and perform wonderful deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your ways, O Lord, that I may live according to your truth. Grant me purity of heart so that I may honor you. With all my heart I will praise you, O Lord my God, for I will give glory to your name forever. For your love for me is very great. You have rescued me from the depths of death. could ever come close nothing can compare your our living home your presence Lord and I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord. and holy spirit you are welcomed here come flood this place and fill the air your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. And I've tasted and seen sweetest of love when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord and Holy Spirit you are welcomed here come flood this place and
stop thinking about I can't stop thinking about I can't stop thinking about your goodness goodness I can't stop thinking about I can't stop thinking about I can't stop thinking about your goodness goodness I can't stop thinking Amen, Harper. Um, Harper is one of our recent high school graduates, and um, just beautiful. And it's, sometimes you close your eyes to listen to the song, and you open them up and think, "Is that sound coming from her?" It's just amazing. I just remember her being in the fourth grade, and it's just really powerful. Our scripture today is the end of Galatians chapter three, and we have been in Galatians the book since. Easter, and, um, and it's been just, a, for me, a very important journey. And our scripture today is actually a very important passage in the context of the days that we're living in, and that this is the Sunday before the 4th of July. We come to a passage that needs to be heard. Now, I'm going to read this passage, and then after I read the passage, I'm going to go into an introduction of this passage in, in how it intersects with who we are as a nation. And I want to say up front that the message this morning is different than how I normally preach or how, how I normally, um, this, the message is how I tend to put them together. I'm going to be venturing into some waters that, that are probably more personally opinionated than, than scripturally focused. Um, I know, I recognize that my role as a pastor is to be focused upon the gospel and to proclaim the gospel and to rightly um, articulate and explain God's word, and, and, I, and I seek to do that today. But because of where we are at in the nation, I feel that, um, that it's important for me to also give to you, to give to us a way of understanding what we are going through biblically and what does that mean to be a person of Christ? How do we follow him in the context of today? So, which means if this sermon offends you, please talk to me. And I know that old people have no problem talking to me and telling me that I offend them. But young people, you have permission to. And if you are young and that, that um, you want to say, Trent, I don't agree with that or I want to understand that, I invite you to talk to me. Um, we are a very open church. I want to engage you. Um, scripture and, and faith is supposed to be done in discussion, and I welcome that from you, um, both the old and the young. So our scripture this morning, Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 to 29. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Let's pray. Gracious Father, um, we come to you today as a grateful people. 
but we also come to you today as a people who um, are in need of your guidance, in need of your care, in need of your protection. So, Father, we do ask your Spirit to be poured down upon us at this time, opening our hearts and our minds, allowing our hearts to be changed by you, by the gospel. We thank you, Father. I thank you. Ask your hand upon this time. In Christ's name, amen. This coming Saturday is, the July, is July 4th. It is a day that we celebrate as a nation the signing of the Declaration of Independence in 1776. And we mark that day, that signing, as the birthday of our nation. But we do so recognizing that signing the Declaration of Independence, to get that independence, we had to fight for it and had to win what is called the Revolutionary War. It was not until the surrender of Yorktown in, on April 9th, 1783, the hostility ceased with Britain. That was the easy part. It took another six years to get everyone to agree on a constitution for this great nation. George Washington became president in April of 1789, almost 13 years after the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And since that time, 244 years, America has burned brightly in this world. As a country, we have fought against forms of global tyranny and terror. We have advanced the sciences. We have become home to the nations of the world. We have championed liberty. I love this nation. And I believe that, uni that the United States of America, according to the providence of God, has indeed been used and continues to be used by God to be a blessing to the entire world as a force for good. We have reasons to hold our heads high as Americans today. Unfortunately, today, this love of nation is not popular to express or to proclaim. In many places and within many ideological groups within this very country, America is hated. And current surveys show that patriotism and pride of country is at an all-time low. There is a shadow on the land. There is a shadow on the land that seeks to erase history and culture and opinions and even freedoms of people or groups that do not tow a certain political line or ideology. And this shadow in, on the land is seen in racism, in acts of senseless violence. We see the shadow in injustice, injustice being used to fight injustice. We see it when power is abused. We see it when people are feared because of what they look like. We see the shadow as race fights against race, as party against party, as urban versus rural, as rich versus poor. We see the shadow in the works of inequality, in the use of lawlessness, and in the exploitation of the weak. We are in a shadow land, tainted by sin, unable to fully live in accordance to the longing of our national heart. What makes our nation so amazing, the light that shines in the, in the shadow of darkness, is what I'm calling the longing of the national heart, the longing of our soul of a nation. The longing is our core national identity, enshrined in the words of our Declaration of Independence. Our country was birthed on the belief that there are certain truths that define who we are, truths that, defined, that are defined by nature and by God, truths that define the role of government, and when those truths are withheld, that form of government or that government should end. What are these truths? You know them. We all know them. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, as written in the Declaration of Independence. This is the heart of our nation, and I believe this is what makes us great. Our nation is made up of people of different histories of different religions, of different nationalities, of different races, and different experiences, how they became citizens of this country. 
in my own family, I, through Ancestry.com, don't know if that's true or not, but I can trace my, my father's lineage back um, to this country to 1620. And one ancestor in that lineage was, um, was, was killed during an Indian massacre that took, took place in Jamestown in 1622. And since they can go back that far on my father's side, there's the full experience of, of the American history. On my mother's side, she actually hung on to her Canadian citizenship um, until about 20 years ago. She was forced to become an American citizen at that time or lose some, some benefits that she had. Her father, my grandfather, immigrated to Canada from the Ukraine to escape communist Russia. That's my history. And I imagine that some of you here probably have ancestors that worked in the coal mines, lived in work camps, fought in the Civil War. Some of you probably have ancestors who built log cabins in these hills and hollers that surround us, cleared trees and farmed the land. And I think that it is possible that some of you may have ancestors who were slaves, stolen from their home country and brought to this land by force. And some of you may have ancestors who were Cherokee or Shawnee, original inhabitants of this land. And like most nations of the world, we are a nation of people with different histories and different religions and different races and different experiences. That's what holds us together as a nation, as Americans, is this belief that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And it is this belief that defines us as a nation, that makes us distinct, and I would say also makes us exceptional. I'm going to take one step further now. I also believe that this defining national characteristic as expressed in the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal, is also what defines our nation as Christian. Many people say that the U.S. of A. is a Christian nation. What does that mean? Does it mean that the founding fathers were Christians? No, it can't mean that because they weren't. Many of them, though influenced by Christianity, were either humanist or deist. And those are not Christian faiths, Christian beliefs. Does it mean that the official state religion of America is Christianity? No, it can't mean that, because central to our identity is this understanding of freedom of religion and the separation of church and state. And in fact, people worked very hard and went to great lengths to not make Christianity the state religion. Does it mean that all people who built this country were Christians? Can't mean that, because many who built this country did so through slavery. How can that define us as a Christian nation? For me, what defines America as a Christian nation is this idea that all people are created equal and, and the long battle we have fought to make it so. And the reason I call this Christian is that this truth and this longing is the natural outgrowth, the natural trajectory of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are a Christian nation because the heart of this nation aligns to the work of God accomplished in Jesus Christ. And I know what I'm saying is not popular. I know what I'm saying will not fly in the press and will probably be scorned and ridiculed. Yet this understanding of equality is the supernatural work of the gospel in this world. The very first story in the Bible, after Adam and Eve are ejected from the garden, separated from God, is a story of Cain and, and Abel, of Cain murdering his brother Abel, brother killing brother. And this simple story is a template for the history of humanity and is a part of the original shadow of sin that has covered all of creation. The template of brother against brother grows into nations against nations, tribes against tribes, one group against the other group. Wars are fought, territories won, villages destroyed, nations, nations um, gather power, people rebel. It's a story of our Bible, and it's a story of our world covered by the shadow of sin. But something happened 2,000 years ago. A light dawned in this shadowed world. The light, of course, is God the Son, very God and very man. 
Jesus came and lived and taught and died and rose again, and his life and his death pushed at that shadow of sin in such a way that sin was dealt with in the lives of those that trusted him. In Christ, I am counted as righteous. My sins are forgiven, and I'm reconciled to the Father. In Christ, God's very Spirit lives in me. And in Christ, I'm brought not only into a fellowship with God, but also into a fellowship of people who no longer live lives in that shadow land of sin, but instead live lives immersed into the truth and reality of God. And this community of people we call the church, we, we, the church is not defined by race, it's not defined by nationality or background or social standing or age or gender. Rather, this community is formed around a citizenship in heaven. It's formed around a common Savior, Jesus Christ. And through this Savior, there is a brotherhood, a sisterhood, that is realized over and above all distinctions. This is what Paul is talking about in Galatians. This is our text this morning. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. It is a remarkable passage. It's remarkable in all of history. And we see the workings of the gospel at work in the early church. We see people who are rich and powerful worship with people who are poor. Example is Erastus, the city treasurer in Corinth, who follows a poor preacher called Paul and even travels the country with a man whose father is Greek and whose mother is Jewish. His name's Timothy. What's up with that? We see people who were slaves, and if slaves in the Roman Empire were invisible, they, were just, they, were, they did not exist among those who were not. People who were slaves are worshiping with Roman citizens. In the book called Philemon, Paul writes about a slave, Winsimus, who was a champion for the gospel. Men and women worship together, and in the ancient world, that just did not happen. And so when I read books like 1 Timothy and 1 and 2 Corinthians, where Paul talks about women in worship, I have to keep reminding myself that they're trying to figure out what it means, what it looks like for men and worship together. It didn't happen before that. The world was changed by the gospel. And I'm not just talking about individual lives or talking about the church, but because of those lives and because of the church, the world itself became changed. Now clearly, as we read through the New Testament and the different letters of Paul, this new reality where there is no Jew and no Greek and no slave or free and no male or female, but being one in Jesus Christ was very difficult to live out. But we do have glimpses in the Bible of what this new reality in Christ actually looks like, what it looks like to be actualized. And the best picture that we have, I believe, of people being one in Christ over above race and nation and wealth and even gender is seen in the book of Revelation. In chapter 7, there at the throne of God, we read, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders, the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessed and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. That, this is heaven. This is God's desire. This is where all of creation is moving towards. This image in Revelation is a world without any shadow of sin in it. This is the gospel lived forward. And I believe that our nation came into being as a glimpse and a longing for the gospel lived forward. That's what I mean when I say that our national longing for equality is the gospel at work in this world over the course of a hundred of years. As Americans, we are a nation that at the heart of our, our identity 
is a reality that is only realized through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want to stress that last part again. The real American dream of true and lived equality is realized through the gospel of Jesus Christ, which means that as a nation, as a people, as we are drawn to the Lord and encounter his grace and trust in him through faith, we as a nation will draw closer to that equality longed for. Conversely, if the gospel is ejected, if the gospel is silent, if the gospel is ignored, we as a nation will never realize our heart's dream. That's what I believe is happening now in our country, and I believe is the greatest danger our country faces. Today, I feel that the gospel of Jesus Christ and what that means is being pushed out of the public square, being silenced or being made irrelevant. Today, many people are spiritual, are religious, and many even believe in Jesus. But just like the Galatians that Paul is writing to, it is a Jesus plus. Jesus plus the law. Jesus plus politics. Jesus plus wealth and power. We as a nation keep trying to change people's hearts through the force of law. And it just is not working. That's the message of the book of Galatians. The law is good. It's important. But it can only take us so far. It cannot do what we long for. It cannot change the hearts of people. And we are a nation of laws, of good laws. And our laws have brought many needed protections. And I'm grateful for our laws and have no problem with implementing new, one, new ones that can show how they protect people. But the law can never change the heart of a person. And trying to get the law to do so causes the law to be a burden, to be oppressive, to be a bondage maker. That's Paul's message in the book of Galatians. And it is the air that I think many in our country are making right now trying to change people through the law, through force, through scare tactics, through social pressure. What changes the heart is the gospel. What changes the heart is the gospel. For it is the gospel in Jesus Christ, it's in that gospel that our hearts are open. The eyes that are blinded by pride and arrogance are opened by grace. It is through the gospel that we find true forgiveness of sin and healing. It is in the gospel that he finds our family through faith in Jesus Christ, a family that all are welcomed into. And this truth has been made known to me in so many powerful ways during my life. One, one way that this truth of, of this family of God being, being bigger than anything else in this world, I, when I was in Kenya as, during my college years, I was on this bus in, in the outback in the middle of nowhere, the bus broke down in this little tiny town. It was nighttime, had nowhere to go, didn't know anybody in this tiny African town. And um, my friend and I asked some people, are there any Christians in this town? And they said, oh, I always think there's a few who live over there. And so we literally walked over there and knocked on their door, and they opened up to these strangers, and, and we said, we're told that you're Christians, part of God's family, and so are we. And we were welcomed into their home as if we were family. That's part of being the family of God. It, it breaks down these barriers. It's remarkable. It is a gospel that makes our heritage that of Abraham. Notice what Paul says in our scripture today. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. The stories of the Bible are mine. They're, they're, the, the scripture is my heritage. The, 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 the people are my people. They are my history. Through faith, I am an offspring of Abraham. It is the gospel that turns us, that changes us, that moves us to become not only a people who receive grace, but live in that grace. It is the gospel that declares that all of life is sacred, that all of life matters. Why? Because the Holy One of God, the Sacred One of God, my Savior died for that life. It is the gospel that God pours out his spirit upon all who believe so that life through his spirit is changed. And this is why I believe that the hope for this country is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We, people of faith, people of the church, 
people who've been grasped by God through Jesus Christ need to live and proclaim and trust and hang on to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, there are some questions I want to ask you in my closing this morning, things I would like you to ponder in your own heart. And the first question is this. Has your heart been changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ? Jesus changes lives. He changes lives. We try to be changed by so many other things, but Jesus changes lives. That's what I believe. Have you confronted your sin? Have you confessed it? Are you being changed? Number two, has God's grace and forgiveness filled you in such a way that you are a person of grace and see the beauty of God's creation in all that you meet. When you see a homeless person, when you see a stranger, when you see a person who looks differently than you, can you see in that person that he or she is loved by God? called into being by him and and is at work in that person as he god is at work in your own life third question are you baptized into christ and have you put him on this comes from verse 27 of our text being baptized into christ is not only about the ritual of baptism but it's about having that new identity of living immersed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. What's your identity? How do you see yourself? Who are you? What defines that? Number four, are you living and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ where God has placed you? Do you love this country? Do you want to see healing in this world? Do you desire the nation to be great? then live the gospel, proclaim it, and be the people of God where God has placed you. I do believe that when we do these things, recognize and confess our sin, recognize and affirm God's love and gift of salvation to all people, and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ through love and grace, that we will see true revival happen in this land. Let's stop there this morning and just spend a moment in prayer. Almighty and merciful Father, hallowed be your name. May your name be glorified and honored and lifted above every name. May your name be lifted up and glorified and honored in every place, in this church, in this city, in this state, in this country. May your name be praised and honored in the halls of our schools and in the halls of government and in the homes of the people. And Almighty God, may your will be done. May your will be the greatest treasure of our lives. May we seek it, pray for it, and live in its reality. And gracious Father, provide for that which we need. And today, we need a lot. We need protection and healing from this virus. We need patience and trust in the divisions that we face in our country today. We need wise and compassionate leaders. We, and we are grateful for the many ways that you have already provided. We do pray that our country will see and witness miracles of your gospel at work, bringing true peace and reconciliation and a changed heart. And we are mindful to give thanks for people who serve hard jobs at this time, for police, for first responders, for those in the military, for those in our schools. We ask that you form in them a just and good heart, protect them from discouragement. We also come to you to ask forgiveness. We do so through the invitation and work of your eternal Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was crucified for sin. Forgive our blindness. Forgive our wickedness. Forgive our arrogance. Forgive us when we think we can do without you. Forgive our greed. Forgive our pride. O oh Lord, we confess our sins to you because we know that you alone there belongs all forgiveness and healing. And as we seek forgiveness, we also ask for your strength and power to truly forgive those who have hurt and wronged us. May your grace work through our lives so that not only can we speak truth of the gospel into the lives of people, but through forgiveness of our own souls, 
Uh, there is a protection that protects us from the bitterness and anger that so many have. Lord God Almighty, there's nowhere else we may turn. Thus to you alone we do pray. To you alone belongs all power and majesty. To you alone belong true healing, and to you alone belongs all glory and praise. We thank you in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, Brandon and Myrna. Our closing hymn today, uh, as we have been doing uh, since this all started, is Trust and Obey. If you all would stand with us this morning and sing. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can arise, not a cloud in the skies. But his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt nor a fear, not a sign nor a tear can abide while we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for this morning, and we once again um, pray, heal this land, um, expose our hearts to you, Expose our hearts to those who are in need. Expose our hearts to things that we do and say and ways that we act that are wrong, um, demeaning to others and, and, and demeaning to you. Father, may we be your people, proclaiming your gospel, and we need your help to do so. We need your spirit to encourage, to strengthen, to send us forth, Father. We thank you. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you.